Hello everyone, this is Randy Coppola from U.S. Launch Report, and I have the distinct opportunity to speak to Chris Crumbly from uh, NASA, and can you tell me first a little about your uh, position here at NASA, sir? Sure. I'm one of four element managers on the Space Launch System, and I manage everything that has to do with the spacecraft and payload integration, which means the adapters, and also the evolution of the vehicle. Well, we had the, before the camera was set up, we had the opportunity to talk, so I really kind of had to have a head start on our viewers, and I would like to pass along some of the things that Chris and I have been speaking about. One of them is the, the size of the future SLSs. I, I had, uh, since it's Media Week here at Kennedy Space Center, I had the opportunity to see the, uh, the launcher and how big that was, and they didn't really explain that that is for a much larger version of this rocket. That's right, and we're building for the biggest version of the rocket that we can build, and that is 384 feet tall. Now, the Delta IV is the largest rocket in our stable right now, and we're talking about a vehicle of the first variant, not the, not the most powerful, but the first variant of this rocket, the SLS, will be 100 feet taller, and it will carry two and a half times more of the payload mass of that largest rocket. And a quick question about the VAB, because we were, we were just there, is... Will the VAB have to be modified to accommodate the largest iteration of this rocket? No, one of the things that we're really focused on on these programs, and these three programs, is affordability. And one of the things that we decided is the VAB is a very large building. So let's build with that capability of the VAB. And so we, we restricted the height of the rocket, of the overall, to the encapsulated weight of the size that we could fit into the VAB. So 384 feet tall. We'll be watching it sail just right out of the, the chute when it comes out of the VAB. That will be an amazing sight. Amazing. Now, I have a question. We didn't touch on it earlier, but are you familiar with the Morpheus Project? Uh, not as much as I would like to be. Okay, because uh, what I understand, it's a lander, and I was wondering, were they considering you know, making it part of the payload for a future SLS? The, the Morpheus is a lander that's been tested here at Kennedy Space Center. Mm -hmm. Well, the Morpheus is really a technology test bed to nice understand it. what the landing would be. And there's, a, there's several technology developments that are ongoing to see what are the technologies that are going to make their way because you want the technology to be mature enough in order to not put risk on the overall vehicle. So one of the things that we're studying, which is really interesting, is when we go to our new upper stage of the SLS vehicle, then you're going to have another adapter on the top called a universal stage adapter that the Orion will connect to. Well, there's so much space that will be, and it'll, it'll look a lot like this stage adapter. Mm -hmm. There's so much space in it, we could put landers in it. We could put habitation oh. modules in and, it. And, yeah, and, and honestly, I have... I've been reading as much as I can get my hands on mm -hmm. it because I understand Congress is funding. I guess they went to the universities and are now forming out ideas about what will be put in these payloads as far as habitation model modules. So we, we have a team called the uh, um, Human uh, Exploration Initiative Correct. Yes. Uh, up in uh, D.C. And so they're looking from NASA headquarters, what are the, all the ideas that have been pent up in all of us? so long about going to Mars and what are the ideas that we can go and tap into in the academia and I'm telling you after having a few contracts with the students the undergraduate and the graduate students in academia and the ideas that they have and what our next generation is doing outstanding ideas and the way that we can take our advanced manufacturing and move that into what they're coming up with I believe we're going to have a great architecture to go back to go to Mars in 2030 and, you know, I, I just want to touch on, because we, we could easily go off on this, but I do want to make sure that our viewers know that one of the most interesting things about the SLS, the Space Launch System, is unlike the Saturn V, even though there's so much comparison to the Saturn V, it looks like the Saturn V, the Saturn V was a moon rocket. That was its primary purpose. This can be a moon rocket, a Mars rocket, an exploration to a asteroid rocket, or take a capsule to the ISS. Well, another thing that you didn't mention is that this vehicle can also be an exploration vehicle for scientific payloads. We are working with a, a spacecraft team now that wants to go to, to um, Europa. And this Europa mission with existing spacecraft, existing launch vehicles, would take seven years to get to Europa. This vehicle can put it there in two, in a direct mission. That's five years of accelerated science for that mission. So it's not just the volume, it's not just the mass, it's the speed that this vehicle can then put things into the solar system. So it's because it'll have a capability of carrying more propellants on board? 
that is part of it. It's about uh, more effective rocket engines, more effective solid rocket motors. This, this rocket, the first time it launches on the Exploration Mission 1, will have 10% more thrust than the Saturn V. And by the time that we get the, the next one, the Mars Journey vehicle ready, it will have 20% more thrust. Which is just phenomenal numbers. I, even just what you had told me uh, earlier, we had a, a great conversation before uh, uh, Mike joined us about the actual capability of these thrusters and how many millions of pounds of thrust. Would you be able to review that just shortly for us about what these, what these motors can do? Sure. So these solid rocket motors are really designed after the shuttle solid rocket motors that we used for years and years. And those motors put out almost three million pounds of thrust. Well, we added another segment that so these these rocket motors are actually taller than what the the shuttle mo rocket motors were. I did not realize that. And it that. puts out 3.5 million pounds of thrust now, and so together, seven million pounds of thrust plus the two million pounds of thrust that you get out of the RS-25 liquid engines, and so in two minutes, okay. these boosters have have really accelerated us to the point to where this core can take us to orbit. And then you take the upper stage and you can go anywhere in the solar system. That's amazing because it'll basically be a third larger of fuels and propellants that will be mounted on top of what you've already got mm -hmm. in Earth orbit and pushing. There's a lot you can do with propellants in space and once you get them there. And that was always why we had to slingshot around the moon and right. use gravitational. We'll be relieved of that and be able to push farther. And that's what this is what it makes us truly a stepping stone to future exploration. Well, do you have any other closing comments uh, for our viewers? We have viewers all around the United States and I believe it a great interest overseas. The Arab world are very interested in our space program. Is there anything you'd like to add? Well, Randy, the thing about it is we're building a capability. And the capability is wherever in the solar system that our policies to, to take us to go and wherever we can cooperate with our international partners, this is a vehicle that, that can do it. Because not only are we building it for today's needs, we're making it viable to the future needs. Well, thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity to speaking with you, and thank you for U.S. Launch Report for the opportunity. I hope you have the opportunity to speak to you again soon. All right. Thank you, Ray.